South Bay family. Welcome. Welcome online. Um, we're so glad to see you. We're up on the north upper parking lot right now. A uh, couple reminders, masks. I have mine right there. Uh, six foot distancing. I kind of need to see some of you guys spread out over here. We can move the canopies. What else is there? Uh, we have communion. If you didn't get it, the elements are up by the table where Julie is. And the restrooms, one person at a time or one family group at a time, six foot distancing. On the wall, there's a little button. You hit that when you're going in, it lights up so everybody knows somebody is already in there. What else is there? Offering. The box is back there. You can off, uh, send it down online. All that kind of stuff. It's so good to see you. You know the Bible says don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. We're trying to do what's right between man and God. And trying to honor God in the whole process. And we're so glad you're here. Pray you're going to be blessed. So join me. Bow your heads, please. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity of being together as a family. We look around and we recognize the need for one another. We ask that your presence would be with us. Your spirit would flood us with peace and joy. You, that our worship would be a sweet fragrance to your nostrils. You bless the offerings. You bless the word as it goes forth. And uh, may it go forth in power. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. Um, greetings in the strong name of Jesus. Can we proclaim this morning that God is good? All the time. And all the time? God is good. Amen. How wonderful it is to see you this morning. I have been waiting all week for another Sunday to show up. And the last week was just, uh, how do you say something is delicious? But that's the way it felt last week. And I've been anticipating this Sunday with you this morning. And so it's good to see all of you today. One of the things that we're trying to do is to avoid the street noise that we had to deal with last week. And I know that was hard to, for everyone to hear. Can everybody hear where you are this morning? Praise God. Also, I can see the whites of your eyes, which is a good thing. Uh, not for battle, <laughs> but for joy. And so it's good to be able to see everyone this morning. Um, long before I ever thought I'd ever be a pastor, I was a Sunday school teacher. And somewhere in the archives of our family album is a picture of me standing in a church parking lot in my early 20s with my eight fifth grade boys sitting on a curb listening to me relate a Bible story. And now 50 years later, I'm standing in a parking lot and uh, relating a story from the Word of God. And it's a blessing to think back to then, to those boys wondering what's happened to them and to enjoy this time with you in this uh, parking lot here. I realize that I am now addressing um, grown-up fifth graders and I also graduated from just boys to also including girls, which I'm really grateful for. It's good to be with you this morning, boys and girls. Thank you for coming. I hope you have your Bibles with you. Would you open your Bibles to Acts 7? We're going to begin in 
uh, verse 9. Uh, those of you that are watching online this morning, just a reminder to you that uh, we don't have captions because this is a live service out here. And uh, inside we could probably still do that, but out here we can't do that easily. And so uh, I want to encourage you to get your Bibles because we'll be doing a fair amount of reading in our study this morning. And I want you to be able to follow along with that. One more thing before we begin. Jose, would you put your arm up and everybody turn around and just look? So whose arm's up? Do you see, do you see that arm up out there? His name is Jose. Would you say hi to him? Hi, Jose. <laughs> Jose is a, a celebrity to me for our church history because many, many years ago, he, he's a barber, and we used to hold Bible studies in his barber shop. And I haven't seen him for years and years, and he showed up here this morning. So uh, as you have opportunity this morning from your six-foot distance, say hi to him personally. And we're glad to have uh, Jose this morning. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our time together. Lord Jesus, in this world, there is tribulation, there's chaos, there's confusion, there's instability. There's uh, all manner of things that are difficult, uh, I think, for all to be able to walk through, but also for those of us who love you. It's a confusing time. And Lord, we are, are here today to have the confusion go away so that your word can penetrate our hearts and our minds once again so that when we leave this place or we leave our homes that we can walk in stability in a world that's unstable. So God, teach us your way this morning in this place, God. Encourage our hearts. Help us to understand what happened in the past so that we can walk um, circumspectly in the age that we live in, God. We bless your name this morning. Lord, teach us again by your Holy Spirit. I've asked you, Lord, that you would baptize me in your spirit so that I might feel the fresh anointing of your spirit upon the things that, you've, that I've studied and put in my heart. I pray, God, that you would also baptize this congregation in your spirit, that we'd have ears to hear what the message is that you would bring to the church this morning in this assembly. And I thank you that you'll do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Last Sunday in our study, Stephen was the first of seven men named and chosen to make certain that the Hellenistic widows of the new church were treated in the same way as the Jewish widows. Through the word... Uh, though the word deacon was never used to identify these seven men, it seems as though their selection and the criteria for their selection was similar to those who were called deacons later in Paul's ep epistles. Most commentators refer to those seven as deacons, though again, it's not specifically stated that they were in that Acts um, uh, context. Stephen appears to have been the leader of these seven men, and I will call them deacons because I believe that's what they were, though it was before the specific office was laid out to the church, it would seem. Stephen ministered faithfully, waiting on tables of the widows, um, and he did that through the Holy Spirit. And because of his faithfulness and God's call upon his life, the Holy Spirit increased his responsibilities, making him a powerful evangelist and even a miracle worker performing signs and wonders by the power of the Holy Spirit. And of course, effective ministry quickly arouses Satan's interests and usually brings contention, and of course that's what happened. Several synagogues rose up to challenge Stephen. I assume it was on theology, though we're not uh, given the specifics of that. Their challenges fell flat, however, under the powerful mind and spirit-enabled uh, oratory skills of Stephen. Of course, Stephen also had the truth of the gospel on his side. We're not told, but it would seem as though the confrontation with the synagogues took place somewhere in the neighborhoods of Jerusalem, perhaps in an open area, a park, a street, a market square, maybe a parking lot. Oh, probably not a parking lot, but uh, in those other areas that were open and common areas uh, for the people of Jerusalem. Failing to overcome Stephen's arguments, they secretly induced, and we talked about that last week, or hired false witnesses to stir up the people. In lying anger, they said that Stephen won't stop blaspheming Moses or his customs. He won't stop blaspheming God or the temple or the law of God. Of course, Stephen was completely innocent of those charges, but they were totally complicit and guilty of those charges, as were their ancestors. The angry and embarrassed synagogue leaders grabbed Stephen, 
and hauled him off to the council, the Sanhedrin, took him into the chamber of hewn stone inside of Herod's temple. The high priests asked for his plea of charges. Are you guilty or not guilty of the charges laid before you? And Stephen began to skillfully weave the history of the Jews from Abraham's call to the time of the, of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and the sons of God's covenant, or the signs of God's, the sign of God's covenant with the Jews, the sign of the circumcision. Stephen walked his crooked prosecutors from Genesis 11 through Genesis 37, 11 in eight verses. And all the while, everyone in the assembly saw Stephen's face as the face of an angel. I was thinking about this this week as I'm studying in, in my office sometimes and sometimes in the living room and uh, sometimes in the dining room. But it, it, uh, 21 years ago, it took me six months to walk through that same information in those chapters of Genesis. But then again, I didn't have the face of an angel. Maybe that was the difference. But uh, uh, he did it so quickly and it took me so long to be able to go through all that. This was a history of rejection and blasphemy carried out by their ancestors and continued by those in Stephen's day. Blasphemy, idolatry, and rejection of God, his person, his laws, his message, the messengers, and his deliverers are all rejections of who he is. At its core, blasphemy is the rejection of God as God. It's the rejection of Jesus as the Son of God and the author of salvation. It's the rejection of the Holy Spirit as he uh, takes and speaks into the hearts and the lives of men. It's the rejection of that. That's what blasphemy is. And their history was rife with all of these. In fact, if we look at the, the unpardonable sin in Scripture, what is the core, the root of the unpardonable sin? It's total rejection of God. It's blasphemy. That's what it is. And um, they also had taken the blessings of God and made them more important than the giver, turning them into idols. In Stephen's earliest remarks last week, he said, God had given them Abraham, the father of their faith, who himself had been chosen and saved out of an idolatrous Mesopotamia. The Jews made being related to Abraham, physical relationship to Abraham, bloodline relationship with Abraham, synonymous with salvation, forgetting that even Abraham had to be saved first and brought into the kingdom of God. Many make that same mistake today, claiming that uh, they're Christians by heritage or relationship in some church or nationality. But salvation is only by personal faith and belief in Jesus Christ. From Abraham would come the patriarchs, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 tribes of Jacob, as well as Joseph, a picture of the coming Messiah. I wish we had time to walk through the life of Joseph and identify all of the different areas where he is such a close picture of Jesus and his ministry on the earth when he came in the incarnation. Um, but the people rejected and sold Joseph into slavery. That was his brothers and doomed him to a certain death only to have him become their savior during the seven years of the famine. God had given them Moses to declare to deliver them from captivity, yet they rejected him and his leadership over and over. God gave them the promised land, and they refused to go in, and a whole generation of Israelites were lost. He gave them the law, yet they often refused to follow it. Some added to it, as the Pharisees did. Some took things out of the law, as the Sadducees did. Some secularized and sensualized the law of God, as the Herodians did. He gave them the temple to worship in, and they defiled it by making it a den of thieves. He gave them prophets and prophecies, but they wouldn't listen, and they abused some and killed some, landing them in captivity. And in Stephen's day, God gave them Jesus the Messiah, and they rejected and killed him. Their history was a history of rejecting God's provision for salvation and safety. It was a history of blaspheming. Yet the gifts of God, gave, that God, or the gifts that God gave them, they worshipped as if they were the giver of life themselves. Their Jewish heritage became their God. The promised land became their obsession. The temple became their strong tower instead of the name of the Lord. 
The law became their source of pride. The prophets, whom they had abused and killed, became selective talking points for arguments and expressions of reverence as though they had followed them, but they had not followed them. So last week in Acts 7, 1 through 8, Stephen reminded them of the history of their Hebrew beginnings from paganism to Judaism. And he reminded them of the promises given to Abraham about a journey to a land of promise, which is where they presently were, even during this time of this courtroom scene uh, with Stephen. God had kept his word, even as they had rejected him. After rehearsing Abraham and Isaac's lives, Stephen begins to recount the lives of Jacob and his sons, the 12 tribal leaders. Stephen called Jacob's sons the patriarchs. And so we pick up our story this morning at Acts 7, verse 9, as Stephen continues his defense of the gospel. In time, Stephen takes them back to 2200 BC. Stephen's date is about 30 AD. Acts chapter 7, verse 9, and that's where we begin this morning. And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. Now, there's one of the patriarchs that's missing there, and that's Benjamin. Benjamin was only 10 years old, so he wasn't part of the selling his brother. But so the other patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all of his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all of his house. Joseph was about 17 years old. I don't know how many of you are 17 years old this morning. I don't remember. I don't know how many of you can remember 17 years old. But 17 years old, this young man was when he was sold by his brothers into slavery. He was sold to the Ishmaelites. And if you remember your Bible history, the Ishmaelites come from Ishmael, which was the physical fleshly son of uh, uh, Abraham and Hagar, the slave, as they tried to produce the son of the promise, and he was not. And from that heritage came the Israelites, Arab nations, some of them, and they came, and uh, the Ishmaelites were traveling from place to place, picking up things to be able to sell in Egypt, and they were also slave traders. And so they sold their brother, Joseph, to the Ishmaelites. And they took him uh, to sell him as slave traders into Egypt. He was sold because his brothers were jealous of his relationship to their father. Their father's name was Jacob, of course. Jacob had produced a coat of many colors, gave it to his son, Joseph, his favorite son. It enraged the brothers. And then Joseph had, a, had several dreams. In those dreams, he saw that his brothers and, his, and indeed his mom and dad bowed down before him. And this also incensed them. And so they sold him as a slave. The brothers, the patriarchs, told Jacob that Joseph was killed by a ferocious animal. And uh, we've seen that in Genesis chapter 37. Joseph was sold to an Egyptian administrator named Potiphar, who, was eleva who elevated Joseph to be ruler of his affairs, except for his own family in Genesis 39 through 41. We remember that Potiphar's wife tried to seduce Joseph, but he wouldn't accept her advances. In the rage of rejection, she claimed that he had tried to rape her. And so Joseph, who had been elevated in Potiphar's household and served him for three years faithfully, finds himself in prison, and he'll be there for the next 10 years because of this false charge. Hmm. During that prison time, he was put in charge of the prison. The, the prophecy came true that even in this place where he would be in slavery, God would still be with him and elevate him. And so even in prison, he's put in charge of the prison. He had by God's power interpreted two dreams for two prisoners, the cupbearer and the baker to Pharaoh, and both of them came true. In Genesis chapter 41, Pharaoh had a troubling dream himself. In fact, it was several dreams that none of his wise men and magicians could interpret for him. And so Joseph, because of his reputation, was called from prison to Pharaoh and correctly interpreted Pharaoh's dreams and counseled Pharaoh to prepare for the fulfillment of them. The first dream was a dream that said Egypt will have seven years of bountiful harvest. The second dream was a dream that uh, Egypt will have seven years of famine. And so Joseph counseled the Pharaoh to prepare in the seven good years for the seven bad years. 
And then we read in Genesis 41, 39 and 40, Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And so Joseph was put in, next in command after Pharaoh to gather the bountiful harvests of the seven years of plenty, to distribute and sell during the seven years of famine. Joseph was given an Egyptian name and wealth and an Egyptian wife and Pharaoh's signet ring and garments of linen and gold chain around his neck, a chariot and an entourage of announcers and a 401k with dental plan insurance. No, that's probably not part of that. Joseph was 30 years old. And he had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Stephen continu continues back in verse 11. Now a famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan. And our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. The our fathers that he's talking about in this portion of scripture refer to the sons of Jacob. They were the fathers of the 12 tribes, the patriarchs. The tribes are back in Israel and uh, are represented in the synagogues in Stephen's day. So Jacob, the father of the 12 sons, sent out the fathers of the tribes to try to find food. The famine covered not only Egypt, but also the promised land and all the lands around. And so there was no food anywhere. Even in the land of, of promise, called here the land of Canaan, the land where Jacob's family dwelt. When Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent his sons to go buy it. None of them realized that Joseph had risen in rank to be the second in command of all of Egypt. In fact, I doubt that they even realized that Joseph was sold to Egypt. They probably thought he was languishing as a slave someplace, someplace else, or perhaps he was even dead, being killed by an angry slave owner, which often happened. As God would have it, Jacob's sons had to speak with the magistrate over the grain. And an Egyptian Joseph spoke with them. Only his name wasn't Joseph at this time. It was Zephanath Paniah, who was no longer 17, but 39, and completely unrecognizable to them. He had Egyptian clothing and Egyptian cultural adornments and an Egyptian hairstyle. Joseph knew who they were. But as he spoke through an interpreter, they did not know who he was. Well, we won't tell the whole story here, but Joseph, without letting them know who he was, sold them the grain. He also imprisoned Simeon, letting the brothers go home, but charging them they couldn't back, come back and buy any more grain unless they brought the youngest son of his father, the, one, the only uh, brother that was his full brother through his uh, mom, Rachel. Verse 13, and the second time Joseph was made known to his brothers and Joseph's family became known to the Pharaoh. Well, Stephen didn't relate all the details of the drama, but can you imagine the drama when the brothers go back and tell them that Simeon has been put in prison? He's already lost one son and now he's another one that's in prison. And now this uh, strong man is insisting that Benjamin, his only son, other son from Rachel, is also uh, in trouble, and uh, it's demanded that he comes uh, if they need to buy grain once again. The brothers still had no idea that they were dealing with the brother they sold to the Ishmaelite slave caravan 13 years earlier when he was 17. But eventually Jacob's family ran out of grain again, and Egypt had the only available grain. So reluctantly, Jacob sent his sons back with Benjamin to buy more grain and redeem Simeon. It was during this second meeting with his brothers that Joseph melted emotionally after seeing his only full-blood brother, Benjamin. He had last seen him when he was 10 years old, and now he's a grown man. In tears, Joseph revealed himself and forgave his brothers, saying, God had a purpose in all of this, that I should come here to save lives and to save a posterity for you. Verse 14, then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all of his relatives to him, 75 people. So Jacob went down to Egypt and he died and he and, he and our fathers died. Hmm. Pharaoh had honored them and had given them the land of Goshen, which was up in the northern reaches of, of Egypt. And it was a land that was 
perfect for raising flocks and cattle. And uh, after Jacob's death, Joseph reassured his brothers who were nervous now, will Joseph take revenge on us now that our father is dead? And Joseph said to them, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. But once again, we see the history of the Hebrews as a history of rejecting the one that God sent to save them. In this case, it was Joseph by the patriarchs, his own brothers. They rejected him and sold him. And then he comes back and he saves them. So Jacob, the first patriarchs, and Joseph died in Egypt during the ensuing years, verse 16. And they, that's Joseph and his brothers, were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. Now there's some um, controversy in this portion of scripture about where exactly they're buried, and I don't want to go through all the controversies of it. Uh, let me boil it down to the best that I understand the situation. You can study it on your own if you would like to. But God had given for an eternal possession all of the promised land to Abraham. He received it all by faith for the benefit of all the Hebrew people, even those who will inhabit it, inhabit it during the millennial kingdom and on into eternity. But Abraham only had the physical title to a burial plot for his own. It was called the Cave of Mechpelah. In fact, if you go there now, and some of you have been uh, to Israel, it's called the Cave of the Patriarchs, which he bought from Ephron the Hittite near Mamre. In that tomb are buried Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, and Jacob and Leah. It's interesting, Rachel, his favorite wife, is not buried there. She died on the road giving childbirth to Benjamin, and she was buried over by, by Bethlehem. But there's another tomb that's in Shechem. Verse 16 told us about that. In John, Joshua 24, 32, it tells us that Jacob bought this tomb, not Abraham. And yet here it says that Abraham had bought the tomb from the sons of Hamor, uh, the father of Shechem. But Abraham had years before uh, his son bought the land, or his grandson had bought the land. In Genesis 12, 6, he had um, purchased, or he had set up an altar in that area. And most scholars believe that he had also purchased the land around that, but he ended up not settling in that land and left that area altogether. And so the land eventually reverted back to the Hamor family. And then in Genesis 33, Jacob repurchased it and established a burial site. And this scripture here tells us that all of the patriarchs, that is the sons of um, Jacob, were buried in this plot of ground in Shechem that Jacob had purchased, Abraham before him. The physical bones and dust are there to this very day. Verse 17, but when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. Still another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not live. In verses 1 through 16, Stephen had covered the period of time that encompassed the lives of Abraham to Joseph from the call of Abraham to their move into Egypt. And now Stephen moves into the next period of Israel's history. He moves 400 years ahead of time from Moses to the Babylonian captivity. And so that's where he will go again to show um, these uh, uh, people that are questioning about the blasphemy that they've uh, been involved with all the years that uh, they have should have been followers of the Lord and listening to him. He speaks here of the time of the promise, but when the time of the promise drew near, what was the time of the promise? Well, this was the time when God was actually going to give Canaan to Israel as a possession and to his offspring after him. Israel, of course, is the other name for Jacob. He had promised this to Abraham. The patriarchs were now dead. And their time in Goshen and Egypt had resulted in many, many offspring being born. They moved into Egypt with 75 people in the days of Joseph when he was there. It's now 400 years later. They were at least a million people in those 400 years. In fact, uh, I would say they're probably closer to three, 3 million people. That's my understanding. It was interesting this week studying through that, looking at some other commentaries, and I ran across the Ancient Hebrew Research Center. 
And they said, no, it was closer to 6 million people. Seems high, but I was pretty young and I didn't count very high back in those days, so I don't know for personally how many there were there. Joseph and his family were celebrities under the Pharaoh that elevated Joseph because he had saved Egypt from destruction in the years of the famine. But now a new Pharaoh from a different segment of Egyptian society took power and he saw the Hebrews as a threat because of their great population that they could turn on Egypt and take over Egypt. Verse 20. At this time, Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God. And he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. That term that says when he was set out is an important term that doesn't uh, tell us a lot of information. And yet, let me tell you what it means. During this time, this uh, Pharaoh that knew not Joseph began a process of eliminating all the male children of uh, the family of Jacob. And so what he did is they began post-birth abortion. Let me say those words, post-birth abortion. We would call it infanticide. And then also he increased and brought the people from a revered uh, position to the hard labor of slavery. And so when it says in verse 21, but when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away, means he was set out to die. Well, his mother... I was trying to preserve his life. And so what uh, the practice was that they would take, the midwives would take male children as soon as they were born and they would take them out to the Nile River and throw them in the Nile River so that they would drown. And so uh, his mother, after the third month, realized that even the sounds around the house would identify a child and he could be discovered. And so she had Miriam take him down to the Nile River and watch him in a basket boat and of course, there probably were sounds of crying babies in the Nile River that might not be unusual because of what was happening, the ugliness of what was happening in that area. And uh, But Pharaoh's daughter was bathing, and she heard the sound of the cry, and she reached out and she grabbed him, and it says, and, and then she took him as her own. Now, the Sanhedrin knew the story of Moses very well. So again, Stephen is brief in his details, We do notice that he makes a point to say that this promised deliverer, Moses, was well-pleasing to the Lord. He also emphasizes the extraordinary education he received in Pharaoh's house and that he was mighty in words and deeds, hardly words of derision that could be considered blasphemy against Moses. Obviously, uh, Stephen was not blaspheming Moses. He had a high regard for this man chosen by God to deliver his people. Pharaoh had commanded that the midwives again were to throw the babies into the Nile River and that the female babies would be saved alive. Hmm. Rescued by a princess. She took him as her own. She hired his own mother to nurse him. She didn't know it was his mother. At Miriam's suggestion, I'll find a Hebrew wife that can nurse him. The princess agreed with that and she hired Moses' own mother The princess cared for and educated him as a prince in Egypt, verse 23. Now when when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. Undoubtedly, Moses' real mother instilled in him the truth of his, of his birth and that God must surely have some plan to use him in a special way for the benefit of his people. Drawn to his Hebrew brother's condition, at 40 he walks out among them and he saw the injustices of the slave masters to the slaves and he rescued an abused brother, killing the abuser. But as we know, no good deed goes yet unpunished. Verse 26, And the next day he appeared to two of them, that's two of his Hebrew brethren, as they were fighting. 
And he tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? Verse 27. But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him, that is Moses, away, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. Well, they failed to see that God had sent a deliverer, and yet they rejected him, saying, Who are you to reign over us and, and uh, to, to do this and be a ruler to us? Moses realized that his killing of the Egyptian was widely known, and so he fled. And by his fleeing to Midian, it caused them to be without a deliverer for an additional 40 years. Well, in Midian, he married a Midianite wife, and like Joseph, had two sons. And for his occupation, he watched his father-in-law's flocks in the deserts of Sinai. Isn't that interesting? Where does the law come from? Mount Sinai. And so he's watching his father-in-law's flocks in the very place he will bring God's people when they escape from Egypt back to receive the law off the mountain that's above the desert of Sinai. So here's a Hebrew brought up Egyptian living among the Midianites. The Midianites were people that came from Abraham and Keturah. If you remember your Bible history, Sarah was his first actual wife. And then after she died, he married a woman by the name of Keturah. And so uh, uh, the Midianites come from that relationship. So he was, uh, he also had a father-in-law called Jethro, who was a priest and a prince of Midian. But it seems that he was a priest who loved the living God. And he was a faithful, helpful father-in-law to Moses over the years. Let's turn to verse 30. And when 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the mountain of Mount Sinai. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And as he drew near to observe the voice of the Lord came to him saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. Here's another one of those dramatic scenes in history that I wish I could see. Another place where I wish there was instant replay in heaven that I could go to the archives and pull that tape out and watch as Moses watches the burning bush and comes near to it only to realize that it's God and he can't look at it anymore. Uh, a bush on fire that doesn't burn. The voice of God, the covenant God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob coming from the fire. Moses was terrified, but, a, but unable to look directly at it. Verse 33, then the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Like the holy of holies in the temple, the area around the bush was made holy by the presence of the Holy One of Israel. I was tempted at this point to stop and say, Would everybody take your shoes off? Uh, because you are sitting on holy ground right now. And it's not holy because of anything more than Christ is in us, the hope of glory. And that he has promised to be with us whenever we gather together. And so as we're studying his word right now, we can truthfully say, this is holy ground. Now it's just a parking lot until so he's here because you're here and I'm here. He's here. This is the holy place. This is where God's speaking to us this morning. Hmm. Verse 34, God said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groanings and have come down to deliver them. And now come I, and now come, I will send you to Egypt. I'm sure that at that moment, Moses remembered the terror he felt 40 years earlier when the word got out that he had killed an Egyptian who was abusing a Hebrew man. In that day, he ran for his life. It was truly here uh, known. Even the Pharaoh knew, and they, he sent out a posse to catch him and to, to uh, you know, who, who knows what to do to him. But uh, in Moses' heart and mind, as he's hearing God call him to go back, he's probably thinking, I've already been there and done that, and it didn't work. And then he begins to give excuses why he shouldn't be the one to be chosen. And in Exodus 3 and 4, the first thing he says, God, who am I? But you should send me to this place. And God said, 
Moses, I will go with you. And then he said, well, who are you? That I should tell the people when I get there, I have a message from who? And God said, I am the I am. Tell them that I am has sent me. In other words, I am the eternal God from all the ages, from everlasting to everlasting. The all-powerful God, the God of the covenant. I am the true living God. I am what I am. Well, what if they don't believe me? And God said, I'll give you signs and wonders to perform that they will have to say, this has to come from God. And then he says, well, I'm not a good speaker. And so send someone else, anyone you want, God, just don't send me. I'm not a good speaker. And God said, I will be with your mouth, Moses. But if you need some help, you can say, you can take Aaron with you. He is a good speaker. He can go with you. And so he did ultimately go with him, but hardly ever said anything because the spirit of God was with Moses' mouth. And Moses could speak the messages of the Lord. Well, in verse 35, Stephen says, this Moses whom they rejected, is uh, God's, God's people saying, who made you a ruler and a judge? Is the one God sent to be a ruler and deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush? He brought them out, and after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. So Stephen has shown them that he is no blasphemer, but that they are, as a nation throughout their past and recent history, they rejected Joseph, but still God saved them. They rejected Moses, but God still rescued them and preserved them and brought them into the promised land where they were now living. They have rejected Jesus, killing him, yet his salvation was still open to them by faith. In fact, he had sent Stephen to them in the midst of even this Herod's temple to testify to him of God's grace for even those people. I didn't blaspheme, but you have been doing that for 2,000 years. And I want to tell you, it's still being done for the next 2,000 years as they still have not received the Messiah that the great I am sent to, to save them from their sins. To reject Jesus is blasphemy. Some do it in ignorance. But as Paul said in Romans verse 20 of chapter 1, even they are without excuse. Those who claim ignorance are without excuse by the testimony of the things that I have made. Everyone is without excuse. Why would anyone blaspheme the Lord who gave his own life so that a man might obtain eternal life? Well, today, anyone by faith can receive salvation. It wasn't purchased cheaply. It was purchased by his blood. But it's free to anyone who will believe on him for salvation. And this morning, even in this holy place, God may be speaking to one person here who has not given their heart to Christ. And he would tell you right now, oh, you don't have to take your shoes off. But if that's preventing you from uh, being able to yield yourself to God, then take your shoes off because it's a holy place. My holy message is coming to you because I love you. And I want you to be my child. And I provided a way of salvation so that your sins might be taken away and that you can have everlasting life. Let's pray this morning. Lord in heaven, we thank you for the privilege that we have of going through these ancient writings which are every bit as up to date as uh, anything that would be written today. In fact, more up to date because they have the perspective of eternity past, eternity present, present and eternity future. So we thank you, Lord, for the ability to be able to walk through these passages. Lord God, I pray if there is someone in this assembly, this holy place this morning that doesn't know you or who is watching by television, that God, you would remind them that the message that they've just heard is a, is a holy call from a holy God who loves them and wants to take their sins away and prepare them for an everlasting home in heaven. And you'd give them the faith required right now in whatever place they are, that they would reach out to you and say, God, I've heard your holy message this morning, and I believe it. And I have not believed it, or at least not believed it enough to respond to it. But today, this day, in this holy time, in this holy place, I give my heart to you and I ask God that you would do what you promised to do, that is to take away my sins. Let me be a part of your kingdom and to walk with me all through the rest of the days of my life. 
and that when I die, I can go to a promised land that's eternal. God, I pray that you give the faith for someone in this place to respond to that message even right now in this moment. We thank you, God, that you are here. And God, now we ask that you would lead us in a time of communion, helping us to remember all that you've done on our behalf, those of us who sit here that know you, so that we would not only obey you by concentrating on that as we partake of communion, but you would, in these holy moments, refresh our hearts and uh, give us a revival of soul and spirit and mind in this time and in this place, that we might serve you uh, not just effectively, but from the deep parts of our heart and life, God. That this wouldn't just be something that we do once a month and it's done and now we move on, but that you would affect our hearts and minds in this moment. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You should have those of you in this assembly here. I hope those of you at home were told that this is Communion Sunday, but the rest of you should have the, the disposable items that are the elements of our communion. And so we want to uh, honor the Lord by remembering what he has done for us in this day. So prepare those and we'll be back in just a moment. We are back. And so I want to read uh, one portion of scripture to you as we prepare our hearts. It's found in Romans 8, verse 34 to 39. Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can ever anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, our overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth beneath. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Jesus Christ our Lord. Again, our salvation is paid for by Jesus, his body and his blood. And so we have the elements before us to be reminded of that. And so I ask that you take the bread. There should be a double layer at the top of your little cup here this morning. Those of you here, pull the top portion off and you should have a, a piece of bread. And so this is to remind us of what he took in his body, the beatings, the pulling of his hair, the stabbing of the the uh, spear, all the things, the, thron, the crown of thorns, all those things he took in his body. This is to remind him this is a, the a symbol of his flesh. And so we take it and we thank him for what he took for us. And then we have the cup, the wine, that reminds us that there is nothing. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It couldn't be anything short of that. There is nothing more precious than that. It took that to take our sins away so that we could be related to him forever. And so he has told us to remember that he spilled his blood on our behalf so that we might be forgiven of sins and be given life eternal. And so let's remember that as we partake of the juice this morning. Our salvation was paid for by Jesus' body and blood. It was freely given. It's been received by faith by those who belong to him. And it's our salvation is preserved in heaven and nothing can separate us from him. And so that's what we remembered this morning, and we thank him for that. God bless you.
this day. Thank you so much, Pastor, for those encouraging words. Um, this morning, if you would like to partner um, in prayer, if you need prayer for anything, we have Jim and Julie here to pray with you. Let's worship our Lord together this morning. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. Grace and peace be with you. Great job, guys. <laughs>